Is the pro-life movement part of a demonic agenda? Welcome to Answers News, July 25th, 2022. I'm Roger Patterson, joined, joined today by Dr. Kaya Kloster and Brian Osborne. Hi guys. And we're going to be talking about that very important topic. And this is something that's come out of the reversal of the Roe v. Wade decision with the Supreme Court's recent decision. And we've got this uh, kind of a shocking headline for you. Woke churches label pro-life movement a demonic agenda and claim God is pro-choice. Now, this might be a very radical idea for you right out of the gate here, but that's the claim being made here in this article. And the, the kind of impetus for this is a lot of states, in light of the uh, Roe v. Wade decision being reversed, and that kind of being telegraphed and uh, hoped for and prayed for by many people for years, have implemented trigger laws, because if that was reversed, it would go back to the states. Right. Now, some states have made those laws that are going to outlaw abortion, and some states have made those laws that are going to put abortion, abortion into place and allow for those things. And in this article, we've got basically a, a back and forth between those different views. You've got uh, the poster child of, of Reverend, um, Governor DeSantis from Florida mm. for those who are trying to outlaw abortion, but his state is only at 15 weeks, not a true uh, ban right. on abortion. And then Governor Newsom from California, they're trying to pay people to come to the state to to get abortions. <laughs> yeah. So we've got these very radical views on different sides of this issue. And thinking through all these, these things, we want to make sure that we can do this as Christians from a biblical perspective. Sure. And life is truly a very important biblical thing we need to be thinking about. And you would think Christians would be unified in this, uh, this issue of life because the Bible really is clear that every person is made in God's image, that you are a person made in God's image from fertilization. God knows us in the womb. He formed us in the womb. Jeremiah 1.5, before he formed us, he knew us. And so the biblical sense is really clear. Uh, life begins at fertilization. So you think Christians will be united in this, but there are many what you might call woke Christians or compromised Christians who are actually steering away from biblical thinking and having a secular worldview even on these issues. And so the article looks into Christians who are actually really abandoning any clear biblical teaching to embrace more of the secular ideology. They quote one woman from a liberal church, evidently, who prayed like this. She said, we pray for all who partner with those in need of reproductive, health care. This is a euphemism for abortion. We pray for those. We pray for the laws of life yet to come from forced childbirth and illegal abortion. These are all talking points, by the way, for the pro-murder, pro-abortion camp. We pray for those who are not yet of the same mind regarding reproductive rights. In other words, if you're not in line with them, you need to get in line with us and our thinking. My question is, who is she praying to? It's not the God of the Bible. But we're seeing really many Christians who are basically just being compromised, compromising God's word to fit the secular thinking of today. You know, I thought too, you know, they, they claim that they believe God is pro-choice. And to you, I also just went to scripture and you mentioned some of the really familiar ones, but you know, Psalm 127, children, children are heritage, a reward. Proverbs right. 17, 6, grandchildren are the crown of the aged. This was an interesting one. In John 16, 21, and it's talking about how during, during child labor, maybe a woman is anguished, yet after delivery, a woman has joy that a human being has been born into the world. And so again, there's just so much scripture that shows God's opinion of children and the unborn. And contrast that with these quotes that I'll read and let Roger assess these quotes here. But this is from lead pastor of Icon Community Church in Atlanta, Georgia. His name is Daryl Ford. He said, if men could get pregnant, this wouldn't even be a topic. And he is pro-choice. He is pro-abortion. He is pro-murder. And actually, it would be because the topic's still the same. What is the entity in the womb? Is it a person or not? That's the core issue. He says, all the guys, let's all, if you believe this, let's all have appointments and get vasectomies. That's his thinking. He can do that if he wants. Not biblical. Uh, and then it just says this, that uh, it's not just about reproductive rights, but about voting rights and civil rights and human rights. What about the rights of the unborn baby? Right? And then lastly, he said this is where the tagline comes from. He asserted that the pro-life movement is the beginning of a demonic agenda and called on the church to get in the gap. All right. I got to throw the heresy flag. Okay. The prayer earlier, this calling, defending of human life, lives made in the image of God. Okay? We have to just point to the fact that this is 
a heretical statement. A, a man standing in the pulpit making claims That's like right. this needs to be called out. These are not biblical claims. Um, this man is leading people astray. Yes. To say that defending life in the womb is a demonic agenda is to do uh, what the, the Pharisees were claiming Jesus was doing, casting out demons in the name of Beelzebul. Luke 11, 15. Uh, Luke yep. 11 talks about that. Yep. Uh, how, can, how can that be the case? Okay. This is the God who is the creator of life, is the one who is forming this young one inside of the womb, who's sustaining it, who's giving the gift of life. Okay. He's the one who we need to be praising and crediting and rejoicing with when that life comes. Now, that doesn't mean circumstances aren't hard. That doesn't mean that we can't empathize and find compassion with and, and love on these people who are facing unwanted pregnancies and those types of things. But that doesn't mean that we seek out an option that leads to the death of the child and the murder of that child. That's right. we, can, we can come with compassion and, and we would encourage all of you to Find ways to be praying for uh, local pregnancy centers, being connected with those, supporting mm -hmm. them. And these are opportunities, not just to help them with physical needs, but to point them to the hope of the gospel. Um, fornication that is leading to these things is a sin that's, right. that is going to condemn these people to hell if, if it's not repented of. Okay. But that doesn't mean they're worse sinners than us. They're, they're sinners who are in need of the grace of God, just like we are. And that's the opportunity for us to come alongside them and point them to the grace of God that can be found in Jesus Christ, what he's done for us on the cross. And that's the real hope we should be pointing to, not vasectomies, okay? not yeah. wondering if men can get pregnant, this wouldn't be a problem, not sociological solutions, it's the hope of the gospel and bringing that to bear on this issue. Amen. And I think it's also a good reminder and a call to us as believers, as you go to a church, take everything you hear from your church leadership and test it by the word of God. We are to be Bereans. We take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And if it just so happens you're in a church like this, then you need to really assess, you know, whether you choose to attend there or not, how that goes, but also be sure you're taking what they say and compare it to the word of God. And God's word is our authority, no human being. Because that same clergy made the quote, he said, he once viewed abortions as killing babies. That is until he prayed for a, a deeper understanding of the issue. Mm. And I just, I don't believe he got his deeper understanding from I scripture. I don't think so either. Not at all. Not at all. All right. Our next story <laughs> takes us down south. That is way down south to Australia. <laughs> More private schools denounce homosexuality, diverse <laughs> gender identity, and enrollment contracts. Uh, my alternate headline for this is Christian School Upholds the Bible. And so we have uh, reported on a similar story before out of another college there in Australia who has within their Christian view of the world and the, the view that they teach statements on human sexuality, that God intended marriage to be between a man and a woman and that you should not have sex outside of marriage and all of those types of things, that there, there are two genders, male and female, all of these things that we would think of as standard Christian teachings that come right out of the Bible. And those are written into their statement of faith and what they expect their students to uphold while they're on the college campus. And that's all coming to uh, a head and coming under attack here as uh, these students at this campus are rebelling against these ideas of the Bible, even though they're on a Christian campus, and the government is uh, up, in, up in arms against all these things. And it's intriguing as you look at the, the school's response to what they're getting. So they're being attacked basically for upholding a biblical position. And they have these statements of faith that are meant there to kind of define who they are as Christian. Also kind of defend them. So this is who we are. This is what we teach. But they're trying to evidently trying to walk this line, it seems, because the schools have responded, yeah, this is what we believe about gender and sexuality and marriage. This is what we believe. But they say also, you don't necessarily have to believe those things to attend here. 
but do you have to follow those things, right? And so they're not really defining that clearly. It's being kind of squishy, and it's really just opening the door uh, for more persecution to come on them because they're not taking that firm stand of actually who they are. Not just believe in these things, but to show true belief, you act on those beliefs. You do those things. Part of being a Christian is not just saying, this is what I believe, but living accordingly, right? We're to obey Christ. That's how we show love for God. And so they're really just kind of opening the door to really just being undermined from the get-go as they try to stand for in some way on this. Uh, and it's intriguing to me too. I wrote this down here as I was thinking about it. I was speaking at a conference last week and I quoted from Genesis and talked about how uh, God made them male and female. And I just made the comment, that's how we know there are only two genders. And it, what was weird was, large audience, they broke out in applause, right? And it just, it, it kind of cracked me up and it made me sad because they were, they were applauding because, wow, you just said something really bold, that there are only two genders. And it just it made me sad because that shouldn't be a bold statement, right? It really shouldn't be, but it is today. And it got me thinking, if you want to be bold today as a Christian, it doesn't really take much, <laughs> all right? Just proclaim basic biblical truths about gender and sexuality and salvation through Christ alone and his word is the authority. And doing that is being bold. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but you can be bold easily just by standing firm on those things. And so far in America, you know, there is a lot of protections for private schools mm. that have a religious base. And they still are being allowed to say, you know, we're going to have a single gender school or we're going to have a certain faith-based school and that they can adhere to certain statements of faith or conduct, um, codes of conduct. Yeah. Um, but I think to your point, like if we don't continue to be bold, those freedoms will be lost they to us as well. chipped away, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's noted here um, by Terry Burke, the secretary for the Independent Educators Union of Queensland, um, nothing is preventing school authority teaching its faith. Nothing prevents that, he said. What's at stake there is an issue about the discrimination enacted upon an individual because of who they are. You can teach your faith, but that does not inherently mean that you have to discriminate. So basically what they're saying and, and reading other things through the article here is you can believe those things, but you can't act on them, Christian. Stay in your closet with your beliefs. Keep them to yourself. You can think them in your head, but don't act them out in everyday life. Don't bring them into the marketplace. Don't act them out. But that is the exact opposite of what our Lord has called us to. In Luke 6:46, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord with your lips, but do not do the things which I tell you to do? In James, we read, why are you hearers of the word and not doers of the word? Those are sinful things. If we don't live in accord with what we believe as Christians, right. we're living in sin and we need to live in a way that is obedient. Now, that doesn't mean that we are hateful and discriminatory to those who are living in those sinful lifestyles. Back to the same thing we talked about before. We point them to truth. We do it in love. We speak the truth in love as we emulate our Savior, who was that embodiment of grace and truth, both of those things at once. But we do it in a way, as Brian mentioned, that is in boldness. And we, we point them to the, to the hope. There is hope and there is, there is salvation and there's, there's freedom. Amen. And the most, the most free people that we can be is when we are slaves to Christ. I think a really important point mm -hmm. to make is that loving Amen. and accepting are two really different things. Yeah, and so to, to, to love them actually is to point them to that truth. Amen. Our next article, uh, science topic, brain size versus body size and the roots of intelligence. <laughs> now this gets us to the question whether calling someone a bird brain is an <laughs> insult or not. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've, we've questioned this before. Why are some animals smarter than others? Is it the size of their brain? Is there a, a proportionality here to the size of the brain compared to the body? And scientists have tried to explore these things. Uh, so this team took a new approach and they tried to compare things in a slightly different way. And they're looking at the, the structure of the brain in birds and how these different things work. So corvids, uh, the group that includes jays and crows, these are relatively smart birds. They can solve simple puzzles and, and do types of things like that. And so they're looking at the area of the brain called the pallium and the way that nerve structures are and how many nerves are in, in the way the brain develops and these different things. And they basically found 
We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Me was, and Kaya had the same thought, yeah, right? Yeah, it was yeah. so interesting because, you know, if they thought maybe if the brain was bigger, it meant they were smarter. Maybe if they had a bigger brain compared to their body size, they were smarter. Maybe if they had more neurons per unit area, they were smarter. And yet, um, it was never consistent. So there were some birds with big brains that were smart and some with big brains that were not. And um, so just back and forth. And I just made the comment, I think sometimes God almost just mixes <laughs> it up to keep us on our toes, right? Right. I think the platypus is the best example right? of that, I'm right? Just gonna, I mean, what just, class do you put this you know, in? Look at that. All right. Yeah. What do you do with that? Yes. Uh, and so it was interesting. They gave so many different examples. There's nothing consistent. And they were doing good science, by the way. We have no beef with that whatsoever. Yeah. The examining of the size of the brain, the neuron development, how those things go, trying to assess intelligence based on that. Even they defined what do you mean by intelligence, which was also good to do as well. So defining terms, doing uh, experiments, the scientific method, all good. And actually, and this was pretty much overall good science, just no real firm conclusions. And, but it's when you have the evolutionary assumptions that we are put up, up in ours, but this was pretty much clean of that. Yeah. They actually even had, they could extract the DNA and run the testing in the field. That was, yes, That's that amazing, was very right? neat. And yes. so it's cool to see where we're getting, you know, with some of our testing tools. That runs right into the next article, I think, doesn't it? Or maybe that is the next one. Uh, yeah, it might be. I, I might have jumped ahead. You might have jumped ahead. That's okay. You're evolving. It's all right. All right. <laughs> um, we can't say that. I actually don't have the slide for the next one, but we can talk about that one. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, it is the next one. Sorry. Ancestral oh, genetic variation essential for rapid evolution of Darwin's finches. So here we see the group of Darwin's finches, uh, which are famous because they were studied by Darwin on the Galapagos Islands. And uh, these finches are actually not true finches. They belong to the tanager group. Uh, little, uh, little side note there. But what they've found is they've studied these finches over time. Uh, they, they believe they're all related to one group of birds that were blown over to these islands that are off the coast of Ecuador uh, some hundreds of years ago. And then they were... Um, this population diversified, and so they've studied the genetic makeup. And what's interesting is these birds have different shapes in their beaks. And the shape of the beak is, uh, determines what types of seeds they're gonna eat. And uh, people like the Grants have studied these things over the years, and the drought seasons, the thicker beaks, they were able to um, chip away at seeds that were harder and different things. And so there's a very uh, strong correlation between the beak and the food source and, and climate and all these different things have been studied. Uh, this study goes at a little bit different angle looking at the specific genes that are responsible for the traits and how those have been uh, present in the population over time. And I think I've found some very interesting data that kind of fits for me what I would understand to be a biblical model of how these birds came to be. Well, and Kai, as you were mentioning, I think this is where they were yeah. actually able to run the, the genome sequence right the on site, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they actually found like 28 gene regions that seem to be associated with this beak development. But the, the sentence that I loved was it said, these genetic variants do not represent recent mutations, but constitute ancestral genetic variation. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is what we've been saying all along is that it isn't mutations that cause this evolution from one kind to another. It's actually a bunch of genetic variation in that original kind that was created. And then just nature working on like drought and different mm -hmm. seeds and needing different food sources. And those pressures select then for different traits. And so it's basically, they're recognizing that there was an original variation in the gene pool that it's been working on ever since. The information was already there already and there. then diversified, like someone created them with genetic diversity already oh. in place. It's almost like Man. God created this yep. giant Easy. genetic gene pool yeah. that allowed these birds to diversify and fill different niches and different habitats. Like when they got off the ark and they That's encountered right. all these different environments that the flood had created and they were able to adapt to those different environments and express these different traits that were in their genome. And in wow. the end, we still have... Finches. Tanagers. Right? Tanagers. Really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, exactly uh, right. again, a good piece of research, if we were to strip out mm. all of the instances of evolution and simply replace them with 
adaptation. That's right. If we, if we took out all of that language that tried to shoehorn that evolutionary idea into there and just replace it with adaptation, we could pretty much agree with everything that it says here because we're just looking at these small changes that happen in this population over time in response to uh, this genetic diversity that's present inside of them. And that's something we say often as you look at these science articles, I and mean, there's some, usually some good stuff in them and the research and so forth. Just be sure to separate the fact from the fiction. Separate the good observational science from the fictional worldview and assumptions they're using to interpret the present day observation. Separate those two things and you can be okay on that. All right, our next story takes us to a nightmarish creature. <laughs> if it were a little bit bigger than it actually is, uh, 500 million year old fossilized brains of Stanley Karras prompt a rethink of, evolution, of the evolution of insects and spiders. That's a mouthful. <laughs> so this, uh, this creature, uh, if you could imagine these uh, little plates sticking off the side here, kind of undulating and moving it through the seas, and then those little uh, arms out there sticking out, unfurling and latching onto your face and these fangs sticking into your <laughs> It's like a horror movie. Uh, so this, uh, this was some type of a predatory uh, arthropod that lived in the ancient seas. Uh, we don't know that there are any of these alive today, so we believe this is an, an extinct creature. And this is found uh, immaculately preserved in the Burgess Shale up in Canada. And the, uh, again, this is a, an article that brings us to the evolutionary connections between all of these creatures, arthropods, and the, the striking thing about this article to me is the claim that comes here at the uh, very beginning. It says, researchers most excited about the 84 fossils, the remains of the brain and nerve cells are still preserved after 506 million years. Now that's imaginary time, yeah. but they have astonishing quality of preservation. The details are so clear it's as if we were looking at an animal that died yesterday. Or maybe something that died thousands of years ago during a global flood, and we buried rapidly then. And by the way, the organic materials that make up these brains, I mean, those things don't last that long after being buried. So 500 million years to hang out to be fossilized doesn't make good rational sense or geological sense when we really break it down. But amazing detail, amazing diversity, no doubt, in this creature. And I'm kind of glad they're not around today because it is freaky looking, not going to lie. <laughs> They were only about 20 centimeters long, so not something to be too scared of. Well, and you Still know, they've, freaky. they've also found <laughs> soft tissues in dinosaur bones. All the time. Which, again, you, right. you would never, certainly not millions of years, but even 4,500 years or so, that's pretty amazing. But I just think, too, it's awesome that God created an environment in the flood that preserved the bones in a fossilization process mm. and some of these soft tissues with almost right. like a, a nature-made glutaraldehyde. <laughs> so it's just a way that he made so that we could see some of the amazing things that existed before. Yeah, so the claim here is that the, the brain here gives us a link between different arthropod groups uh, that the, the different regions of this brain then branched off as we see different groups of arthropods like spiders and insects develop through the evolutionary chain of time. And this gives us a glimpse into how those pieces are linked together in that branching tree of life. But uh, from the biblical perspective, we just see uh, an amazing creature God's designed with this weird eye structure up on the top in the center and a different type of brain structure rather than asserting all of this storytelling into how these different groups developed, That's right. uh, we've got a, a diversity of creatures that, that God's created. Uh, very creepy looking <laughs> creatures, <laughs> uh, very interesting creatures. And, uh, but and actually all the extinct ones were, they had a two segmented um, body mm -hmm. and arthropods today have a three segmented body. And so they propose it as an ancestor and that there's an evolutionary process, but we don't, we don't have any any of the in between, there's no right. transitional organisms to verify how they would have made that leap. So again, amazing remains we can study and learn about these creatures in the past from, amazing remains. But then from the evolutionary perspective, you have the assumption of relationship based on evolutionary ideology, the assumption of progression from two to three different segments, when really we're just looking at amazing diversity put there originally 
by the Creator. Again, the glasses you put on to interpret these things through is absolutely fundamental. And Brian, you've got a book over there that helps we us do. think through some of those issues. So this is a great book by Dr. Nathaniel Jensen called Replacing Darwin. So here's the big, thick one. You read the whole thing or Replacing Darwin Made Simple. Same ideas, just a bit more concise. And so what he does here is just show in a phenomenal way how real science and real genetics confirms biblical creation. As you look at the genome and mutational rates and diversity, what we actually observe fits the biblical timeline and fits what we expect to see within a biblical worldview and really undermines the whole premise for evolutionary ideology. All right, our next story is a little bit depressing, but Dutch health minister recommends allowing euthanasia for young children. Now, we've seen these reports coming out of the Netherlands and Belgium for many years in other European countries, but right. basically they've allowed euthanasia for children 12 uh, and up and for adults and even uh, children under the age of one. But now this minister is proposing that basically at any age, children would be able to be euthanized. Now that word basically means good death mm -hmm. and that's what it is. It's a euphemism. It's a way that they can couch the term for murdering children in a clever little phrase that makes it sound nice. And as we consider those things from a biblical perspective, is there really a valid reason to be taking the life of a child, even if, as this article asserts, they would be doing it in situations where they're suffering under some disease that's un incurable? And of course, I mean, we know biblically the answer is no. And, and what this article does and what this idea really tries to do, it, it appeals to, it does appeal to a biblical principle, and that is that you know, we should have love for people and we should have mercy towards people and they are worthy of dignity and respect. And so we should care for them. That's what they're trying to appeal to. And by the way, all those things are true and biblical. We should have love for people and show dignity because they're made in God's image. And then they say, based on that, well, we should be able to kill those who are suffering. But guys, that is murder. Taking someone's life, no matter what you call it, is murder. And we don't have the prerogative, the authority, nor the right to decide when anybody dies, including even ourselves. That is God's jurisdiction alone as a creator, as perfect judge. And so he decides when that occurs. And so we leave that in his hands. And yes, we realize there could be suffering and pain and hardship if people live through different diseases and hardships. But you know what? God can heal. God could use that suffering for his glory to show how he preserves people in that suffering. He can exalt his name in so many wonderful ways that we just can't know. We trust him with all that for both the temporal effects here and for the eternal ramifications for his glory and our good as we rest in that strength of his. And so euthanasia, though it sounds like it's good because it's the idea of showing mercy, it's showing mercy by advocating an unbiblical idea, basically murder. So the two cannot be married. And the article does recognize this is one that would be an advocate not for euthanizing these children. And they say what these children need is better palliative and comfort care mm -hmm. and dedicated medical team who'll do everything possible to make sure they're well cared for. Sure. And I would add, you know, and they need love and prayer and faith and hope. And, and we don't know what God can do with that time that remains as they are here on earth. You know, in, in all suffering, that, that's a time where we consider our mortality and yeah, it is. And I'll tell you something else we talked about back, backstage. I think part of what rubs us the wrong way about this as people who live in a, in a Western culture in America, the main idea of our culture is autonomy, right? Autonomy is king in our culture. That's why you get the idea you can redefine your gender, redefine sexuality, redefine, you're your own God, uh, live life as you want. You can define these things. You are your own king. The Bible says something very different. No, we're not God. Only God is God. And we have to submit to him. And I think even as Christians, sometimes we, whether we mean to or not, we're actually embracing part of the secular ideology by embracing those ideas. No, God is king. We submit to him. We don't have total autonomy. That's a good thing, though. We make the worst gods. We really do. God is God alone, and he is the best and perfect God, and we submit to him. Amen. All right, the next article comes to us from Science Daily. When I read the title, I wondered if it was going to be a biblical exposition on ecclesiology, <laughs> but it turns out it wasn't. Uh, the importance of elders. So here the, uh, the authors of this paper look at the importance of having grandparents, not, not elders in the, in the church sense, uh, but the importance of having grandparents and others in social structures from an evolutionary perspective. Again, they're looking at this from a very utilitarian perspective. 
seeing uh, natural selection and those roles of uh, being able to produce and then in most animals, which they view humans as merely animals, advanced animals, you would lose that, you'd have fertility and then you'd die very soon after that. In humans, we have a long age of um, life after that fertility ends, uh, especially for women. And then we have all this time that we're not being productive <laughs> from that sense of producing children. So what's the benefit from an evolutionary perspective? And so they try and analyze that and they look at it from sociological factors and try and evaluate those things. And they take what we would call a very utilitarian approach to this. What's the usefulness of individuals? And they try to, to derive some of these things and think through some of these things. And ultimately they arrive at the point, well, it helps your, um, your grandchildren survive. So they come up with the grandmother hypothesis. Now <laughs> you and I are both grandparents, yeah. Kaya. You haven't reached that stage Not yet. yet. <laughs> I got friends who are, but All yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So um, being a grandparent, I can appreciate that. We get the opportunity to help our grandchildren develop. And so we're helping our children um, raise them and passing on those values, helping the people in the tribe, as it were, develop mm. those things and developing uh, skills and passing those ethical values on and things. Uh, but ultimately, it wound up being just a, a wash of uh, of nonsense for me because it's just more utilitarian. It benefited us, so we did it to, to get more food from people. And that's not how we should view the world as a Christian. Our ultimate view should be to love others more than ourselves. Well, and I think too, again, through the biblical, you know, we are uniquely created in the image of God. We were different from the animals, so that we have a different post-fertility survival rate than other animals shouldn't be surprising to us. And I think, you know, when we think about the value of life, it doesn't come from your ability to contribute to the food stocks or whatever evolutionarily was important, um, but rather we, our identity comes from Christ. And as, as we walk with our children and our children's children, you know, we mm. have, we have so much wisdom. <laughs> but, it's all these great, these but, are wisdom streets. But seriously, you know, and I think sometimes in our culture too, we have like, even our small groups will have for age groups. And I think we're missing the blending of yeah. generational wisdom and the, the freshness of youth with, you know, it just, it's good that we would mingle together. So, I, and this Absolutely. did touch on that. Um, it talks about that food isn't everything. Mm -hmm. Children are also taught and socialized, trained in relevant schools, uh, skills and worldviews. And then it also goes on, uh, the last line says, much of the huge value of our elders goes untapped. It's time to think seriously about how to reconnect the generations and harness some of that elder wisdom and expertise. And I just thought that was well said. It is, and, and sadly, it's coming from the evolutionary right. perspective, but it's such a good point. And just two things I'd like to just kind of continue what you were already saying. Number one, I think we need to realize that this article makes a good point that we need to appreciate our elders, those who are older and wiser and live longer life than us. And I really think in our culture, youth is so prized and so lifted up as the, the pinnacle of what life is about and who you should be following, when in reality, those who have lived life and lived it well what a blessing, what a font of wisdom and, and just and, and encouragement they can be to us and empowerment as we follow and trust them. And of course, if they're rooted in God's word, ultimately, all right, that's the ultimate authority. But those Christians who have walked a long time in accordance with God's word can be such a help to younger Christians. So we should be looking to them, right, for that discipleship, for that mentorship. Second thing I would say is this, I would challenge those who are in that age bracket, those who are grandparents or great-grandparents who have retired. We have this American philosophy that you retire and you're done and you go play golf. And I would encourage you, I would say that's not biblical at all, right? We never retire from Christianity. And in truth, if you are a grandparent or great-grandparent, what a wonderful opportunity and privilege and ability you have to influence your kids and your grandkids for the glory of God and the cause of Christ unique to you. And he's raised you up for such a time as this. And so you've got that blessed privilege. Take it and use it for his glory. And we don't, we don't see the world in utilitarian ways. We don't kick our elderly to the curb. That's right. First Timothy 5.3 says that we're supposed to care for the widows who can't care for themselves. And we, we love them in that way in sacrificial ways. 
All right, that's all the news items we've got, but an announcement coming up in August, beginning uh, August 2022. We're going to be shifting our format a little bit, uh, presenting the news to you on Mondays at 2 p.m., dropping the Wednesday program. Uh, we, our philosophy is going to be uh, less is more and try and uh, give you the real meat of the news. So we'll be shifting to a Monday-only program starting there in August. Yep. And we've also got some great things happening down at the Answer Center at the Ark Encounter. Our 40 Days and Nights Nights of Gospel Music is uh, kicking off on August 2nd. Uh, that was a great uh, success last a lot year. Of fun. <laughs> Lots yeah. of fun down there. Uh, so I hope you'll be able to take advantage of some of those great gospel uh, groups and, and individuals who will be there. You can find out more at 40daysofgospelmusic.com. And then uh, don't forget about our new Bouncer Pass. This Bouncer Pass allows you to get unlimited visits to both the uh, ARC and the museum over a three-day period within, or three days within one week. So if you're here in the area, you want to see other attractions like the aquarium or hit a Reds game or a Bengals game coming sure. up or maybe play some disc golf while you're in the area. <laughs> some good courses, yeah. And, and uh, one of our great courses. And you're going to stay here for the week. You can pick three days and, and come and enjoy the attractions and uh, enjoy that. So that's all we've got for today's edition of Answers News. We'll see you next time, and God bless. See you guys.